Hi all. I'd like to discuss a philosophical question I've been uh, musing around in the last couple of weeks. It all started from a Blitz game played on Sunday. Uh, so this Blitz game against Ralph Quast, uh, it was this position. I played a casual move, Bishop d7, and it turned out that my opponent could now unpin with Queen f2, and I had a very difficult game after playing c4. The game continued g4, and I had to face uh, considerable difficulties. Eventually, I managed to swindle the win from a lost position. But I was uh, looking over this game after. My opponent uh, was much lower rated. Maybe I was also playing too quickly. Uh, but that's why I thought, uh, well, okay, uh, maybe I underestimate the opponent. But also, was I too casual in my thinking in general? Uh, around here, you know, there seemed to be a pin. And maybe I had rejected it uh, to play f6, which seems natural. Uh, because of knight c6, you know, hitting my queen. So I thought, uh, well, I prepare f6 instead. My move kind of, you know, prepares f6 by playing bishop d7. It turns out, though, you know, after queen f2, you know, the pin's gone, that's it, the opportunity's gone. But it does turn out also that, um, in fact, after rook takes e2, I'm looking at a square near the opponent's king, which is sometimes dangerous, and it be can become a common square after knight takes d8. Can you see what black could do here? If I give you five seconds. Okay, it turns out there's bishop f5, so threatening a mate in one, and also the knight. So for example, knight c6, rook takes c2 check. Okay, and uh, it got me thinking though, uh, quite deeply, quite philosophically, which doesn't usually happen uh, from a blitz game. Usually it's a long, very long, painful uh, one day game or something, or one day tournament. And I start really, you know, reassessing my uh, philosophies about the game. So here you might think, well, why, why would I re reassess anything here? Okay, I, I should have maybe calculated f6, you know, for longer. Maybe, you know, we're all in these positions, we have these pins and, you know, maybe sometimes we're not optimal in exploiting pins or even loose pieces or even king safety. Any basically tactical liability you can think of. Maybe we're not all the time like computers, are we? Opt you know, optimally uh, doing the damage. But um, I'm also into IT, com computers, and a big aspect in the computer world in designing systems is that of reversibility and scalability. When you design things, or, or the process of design, there's the idea that you want to keep things as reversible as possible in your decision-making process. This is a very well-known well sort of known concept and philosophy, and um, you, you choose the best moment to make any committal decisions, basically, if it's an IT system. When we're playing chess, I, I I looked at this game with engine and basically it would have been like minus like five or something, even more than what the piece is worth if I had played this uh, continuation. Uh, it's it's just very, very bad for white in general. And damage would have been done in an irreversible manner. And you may think, yes, so what? But this this is the point, because has anyone really talked about what a strong move is in chess? It seems one of the most obvious points to sort of question. But what videos have actually talked about what is a strong move? Strong moves in the informative era were ones with, with exclamation marks. Very strong moves, two exclamation marks. It doesn't really give an idea of the philosophy of a strong move. If you are in a very, very advantageous position where there's an opportunity uh, for a strong move. To me now, I'm looking at this philosophically, I'm, I'm thinking a strong move is one where there is a level, a threshold of what I would call irreversible damage to the opponent's position. Now, 
in our modern culture of very, very fast chess, blitz chess, even bullet chess, or even fast time controls, the notion of playing strong moves is generally traded off against the time control. So it encourages this culture of not really doing damage to the opponent's position, doing moves which are just as harmless, you know, mostly harmless all the time. Uh, basically, these mostly harmless moves uh, are creeping in uh, to you know players online. It's just casual, you know, mostly harmless moves all the time, with half the eye being kept on winning on time. So yeah, this got me thinking that actually. Is this even worth a discussion video? Well, clearly you've got to this point in the video, so I'm going to continue just 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 emphasizing this point about reversibility, uh, because to me, you know, sometimes trivial things make a massive difference in popularity or uptake. Uh, for example, in the computer world, uh, the notion of data types uh, has made JavaScript. There's a new flavor called TypeScript, so they're stricter on data types. And it helps the programmer uh, basically know to to reduce errors. So in chess, you know, maybe this idea of irreversible damage is a kind of data type to strive for consciously. That when you play a move, and especially where there's an element of tactical liabilities, uh, you don't just want to play any old move. You want to make sure your move really does a level of what I would call irreversible damage, where the opponent really can't easily come back from the damage you've just incurred. Because otherwise, we just play moves that really are too soft all the time. Even when there's great opportunities for irreversible damage, we're just playing these soft kind of... They're not really doing the damage, basically. <laughs> and so this relates, actually, to one of my students who, in a long time control, is still playing moves, to, you know, quickly. So whilst I have emphasised, you know, try and find the downsides of the opponent's position, uh, you know, tactical positional downsides. Yes, and and still though, you might be content. Uh, okay, you, you're sort of exploiting the pin. I might be content if I look at this to consider the bishop d7 as a kind of well, I'm looking into the downside of the pin to play f6, but they're going to unpin. They're going to completely remove that liability on the next move. So really, you've got to sometimes really do the, the irreversible damage when you can the, in that moment. You've got to play that accurate move when the opportunity comes, where that tactical liability has that window of opportunity for exploiting. And I think, so this idea of the kind of chess data type, shall we call it, of irreversible damage, it's not really, I've never seen it being really talked about and nor the notion of what actually a strong move is. Now you could argue, well, in a lot of positions, there, there is no notion of irreversible damage because it really depends on the opponent to make a mistake or to have some concrete liability for you to capitalize on, uh, you know, to take that opportunity to, to create the irreversible damage. That's true. Uh, so, you know, maybe you could argue that the strong move in this video is where, you know, there is something to exploit. Uh, you don't want to have those regrets, though, in such scenarios like this one, where after you look at the game and, yeah, there was this big thing you didn't capitalize on. But uh, I think the whole motivation uh, for irreversible damage to me as a very fast player, often uh, I should be spending more time on moves, is to me at least a valuable one. Uh, it's kind of an aspiration almost that... Um, on the chessboard, maybe it is our duty, an ethical duty, uh, even if you're playing in a blitz game, even a five-minute game, or you know, uh, to to find such moves where where you have such opportunities to incur what I would call irreversible damage to the opponent's position. And I thought, well, will this really affect my play? And I did find, uh, you know, some some good results in online tournaments after this kind of awakening. So it's not just about finding downsides and being content with uh, moves uh, in a general uh, sort of way that they, you know, they slightly tap into something about the opponent's possession and you sort of tick it off, you make your move. No, it's a kind of stricter sense, definitely asking, you know, is that irreversible damage there with the move you played? So is it truly a strong move? 
by that definition I think is very very interesting so yeah I did find myself with with this view in mind of irreversibility as the kind of chess data type so to speak to aim for I did find myself slowing down a little bit more at critical positions in particular uh, where there were these opportunities for such damage so I, I did improve my enjoyment of chess I think since this kind of mini epiphany and yeah I really don't know how you're going to take this video it might be pure common sense or it might be I hope shedding light on something you might not have questioned before that you're going to you know you're going to have these opportunities in your chess games uh, especially you know on the faster time controls there's liabilities there's pins there's there's things to exploit that motivation you might need that extra little bit of motivation to exploit them so maybe think about this irreversible damage concept and please let me know if it slows you down a little bit at least at critical uh, points and if you've won games because of that please let me know if this video has helped it's just it's helped me and I thought I'd share it and also I, I wanted to share it with actually a student who's been uh, playing moves a bit too quickly so maybe from that angle as well uh, you know if it just gets you slowing down a little bit more even in fast time controls but especially in longer time controls when you've got a lot more time to calculate things then yeah that's great please let me know okay thanks so much